What was your dream, Fraser? Oh, all right. <laughs> it starts out in a CD motel room. I'm naked. Interesting. Yes, well, then the shower turns off, and out from the bathroom steps a man. All right, go ahead, let me have it. Are you saying that now, or is that a quote from the dream? <laughs> I just wanted to let you know about my study group. Oh, don't be a funny duddy. I'll be your study buddy. I'm about to embark on one of the great challenges of my scientific career. This work right here is going to change history. I think this is going to be our greatest mission. I don't have time to study. I'll never get into Stanford. I got big plans for you tonight. I got maps. I got charts. I'm going to see you through this because my credibility is on the line. It's at this point that you'll want to start taking the notes. Welcome to The Sitcom Study, the podcast where we contemplate the TV shows we grew up with and search for the truth and wisdom within the tropes and cliches. And today, we are diving into the depths of the subconscious. What are we talking about today, Amy? Today's episode is all about dreams. Yeah, we're doing dream episodes Lots. <laughs> yeah. Well, those those are more for fantasy daydreams. I yeah, feel that's like is true. when we get that's the more wavy like dream sequency. But uh, this is actually all of our characters fall asleep. Yes, and have a dream. These are proper nocturnal dreams. What are the episodes we're doing? All right. So we're going to start with Punky Brewster, season one, episode seventeen, "My Aged Valentine." And then Growing Pains, Season 3, Episode 10, This Is Your Life. Who's the Boss, Season 6, Episode 3, In Your Dreams. And Frasier, Season 4, Episode 3, The Impossible Dream. A lot of references here in the uh, titles. You're not going to make... I mean, it's just because there are so many titles of things that involve dreams that it's like they, they can't resist. But so let me ask you, what, what is your deal with dreams? Are you somebody that has a lot of vivid dreams? Do you analyze your dreams? Are you someone that looks for the meanings like Frasier? What, what are we <laughs> dealing with here? So I, I do dream like I am a person who sort of remembers my dreams. But I think like a lot of people, you know, I won't remember like right away when I wake up. Usually it's something will remind me later on in the day and they'll be like, oh, yeah, I had a dream about that. Every now and then, if I have something a little bit more disturbing of a dream, like we're going to see with Frasier, where it was like bothering him because he couldn't figure out what the deal was, then I will do the thing of like, hmm, what are some of the symbols that I remember from this dream that I could kind of look up on some sort of dream dictionary and see if I can connect to something in my real life to see what it, what is the subconscious stress that I'm trying to work out while I'm sleeping? Yeah, I've never really bought into to, for myself anyway, that sort of thing of like, well, a cat symbolizes wealth, but a dog symbolizes danger, like this sort of one-to-one thing. I currently don't dream very much at all in ways that I remember, but historically, I would have a lot of vivid dreams, almost always bad, uh, all anxiety nightmare dreams uh very familiar with the i have to go on stage but i didn't learn my lines type dreams lots of the bombs are falling type dreams lots of driving off you know driving on a windy cliff type things uh, all of your sort of standard very stressful yeah, and I never look into like, well, well, what could that mean? To me, it's obvious. I'm just stressed out. I'm an anxious person. I have dreams of danger and peril, and that's that's just <laughs> it's the way very it is. Clear. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we'll see how it plays out with these different characters. Um, but this is one I've been looking forward to for a long time because in in various different ways, as we'll see, sitcoms tend to have fun with dream sequences. It's an excuse to do things that you can't do in real life. Yeah. All right. So let's get into it. We're starting with Punky Brewster. First time on the pod. What's your history with Punky? Oh, I love Punky Brewster. I was very shocked to hear that she was in third grade. For some reason, I had in my head that Punky and I were the same age and that she saw that Challenger disaster episode that they did that was later in the series 
she watched that in her kindergarten class, just like I watched it in my kindergarten class. But that is a total false memory. She, it was a couple seasons after this, like season yeah. three or something, two maybe, at the very end. And so she was in third or fourth grade. But she's such a tiny child actress that I just always had her kind of pegged as younger, I guess. Yeah, I was not into this as a kid. This was one of those shows just like from this bizarro alternate universe where I would go over to a friend's house and they would be watching Punky Brewster. And I was like, oh, this is nice. I never heard of it, like never saw the commercials. It's like we must have just not been on that channel or something. To well, me- and it was for girls. I mean, it was for kids, but like, it's all about punky power. Yes, you there's know? a little bit of a little orphan Annie, Pippi Longstocking kind of thing going on here. But yeah, I always, I would hear that name and I thought of it as almost like a Pee Wee Herman type thing where I didn't understand that this was just a TV sitcom character. I kind of thought Punky Brewster, like, who is that? Is this like a, a person, like a figure in our culture? Like, I just didn't ever really understand what the deal was with her. Now that I've seen the show, I want to ask, boy, were we obsessed in the 80s with the thing of being adopted by a rich family, right? Like, you just see that Reagan era mentality on full display where it's like, wouldn't it be so cool to be rich? We don't want to have a show all about rich people because they're snobs and we can't relate to them. We need to have all of our shows be about normal everyday people like you and me that somehow ended up living in the world of the Manhattan upper crust, you know? Oh, that's interesting. And that, you know, you may be getting that impression because, uh, it's a sitcom and so they're in Chicago and the apartment is palatial even though we know that's not how people live in big cities but there is an ongoing thing throughout many seasons Henry is not wealthy Henry is kind of a struggling photographer and so he that's the if you don't know Punky Brewster Henry is the um, older gentleman who is you know I mean I would say late 50s 60s he's her Mr. Drummond yeah he's like a grandpa age you know who adopted her because uh, well and it takes multiple seasons before that actually happens because the state doesn't want him to be a foster parent because he doesn't make enough money. They live in kind of this rundown building the way he found Punky in the first place. So Punky's backstory is her father deserts their family and then her mother abandons her in a shopping mall. And so she wanders around the shopping mall or the grocery store or whatever and um, with her dog Brandon and then eventually wanders into this apartment building where she finds a vacant apartment and is living there on her own and then she's discovered by Henry and Cherry's grandmother in turn and they realize that she's living alone in this apartment and that she's been abandoned and so then there's all the back and forth with the foster system and she gets sent to an orphanage she gets sent back to that children's home multiple times throughout the series when you know Henry at some one point in the series gets sick right so there that's interesting though that you would say like oh the rich people adopted her yes it is and now that you say that i look back on it and go okay i guess i was projecting that the reason why i say that is mostly because this henry character maybe he's not a rich man he just i remarked he looks like charlton heston he just he has this like sort of old proper man kind of kind of way yeah he him. has the almost the fraser voice yes, like he yes, is a little a bit english yeah he's yeah a little bit english. absolutely uh so okay it makes sense that they're not wealthy per se i have to say I had assumed that the backstory was her parents were dead, a la Different Strokes or Webster. What you just said is somehow darker than yeah. that. And, and the show uses its many, the you know, that backstory and just the fact that they're like working class to kind of, they, they exploit that for many opportunities to teach lessons. This is a show very much meant for kids. It's all about teaching lessons. Like this episode we're going to watch is very much about consent and it's 1985. Like, who was talking about consent in 1985? Yeah, I, I think that's debatable. It touches on the issue of consent, but the way it deals with it is a little... I'll just say it's it's interesting from, from a 2023 standpoint. Yeah, but it's also the kind of way that you would deal with it in with children, right? Yeah. So going into this particular episode, like you said, it starts out with a lot of stuff in the school, and it is surreal. The whole tone of this show 
is a little odd. There's music playing, I noticed. There's this weird music bed playing underneath the scenes, which is very unusual for the sitcom form and kind of distracting. And yeah, you remarked, why do they have lockers? That's true. But to me, the larger point was, why are all of these kids milling around a hallway as though they're like in a free period in high school. These are like seven, eight-year-old kids, and they're all standing around this hallway like it's saved by the bell. You know, various adults are coming through, chatting with them and continuing to walk. I'm like, don't these kids have anywhere to be? Right. There is no, there's very, like in third grade, there's not a lot of um, passing time between classes. And generally you're walked from place to place by your teacher. When I worked in Amsterdam, the, the kids would, from third grade up, or end of second grade up, I guess, were allowed to walk themselves to recess or to lunch and then walk back. But it wasn't this like hanging out in the hallway. They didn't stand there and dish for like 10 minutes, you know, outside of Mrs. Henderson's classroom or something. I mean, I don't know. Maybe they did. And when they when they finished lunch, they were just like hanging out. And it gets even stranger when we get into their conversation. It's little Punky and her two friends, Sherry and Margot. The whole story is that her her friend, her fellow third grader is like, you're you're nobody if you don't have a boyfriend. In this first scene, she's annoyed because she's been standing there for this random, weird, you know, 10 minutes of passing time between third grade classes. And all the kids is all they're talking about. It's Valentine's Day. And the teacher loves Valentine's Day. It's her favorite holiday and she can't wait for it. And then all the kids are so excited. And they're all talking about how like, you know, even the boys, like the 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 three little boys that are also like part of their crew or whatever are so excited. And so the kids are all paired up. You know, Sherry is with Alan and Margo's with whatever that guy's name is. And they're like, you know, making goo goo eyes over each other and talking about all these fancy Valentines they're going to give each other the next day when they do their Valentine exchange. And everyone's saying to Punky, oh, aren't you excited about Valentine's Day? And she says, no, I'm not. I'm not interested in that. I know I'm not like I'm fine. And the, the girls just can't believe it. They're like, How, what do you mean? You're if, yeah. if you don't want a boyfriend, you're going to end up alone. And that sort of sets the thing, the tone for the whole episode. Yeah, it's one of these, you know, what would be a pretty standard storyline if this were about like women in their 30s or something. It's just the standard like teenagers. Yeah, you could see teenagers having that conversation. But even then, I would be making the remark like, sure, it might feel like that, but it's pretty silly to think you're going to be alone forever just because you don't have a boyfriend now. It's absolutely ludicrous when you're talking about third graders. But yeah, there is a pretty big plot twist involving a guest appearance by Ricky Schroeder. Yeah, from Silver Spoons, which aired, you know, kind of at the same time. So Punky Brewster and Silver Spoons were these right after football game shows on Sunday night. And I guess Silver Spoons also was like a Saturday morning thing at some point, too. So anyway, they were both NBC shows and Ricky Schroeder is the love interest for Punky. And so he comes up and, uh, you know, all the the girls, Margot and Sherry, are saying to Punky, you know, are you going to give whatever that kid's name is, a valentine, or, you know, maybe he'll give you a valentine. Won't that be special? Because, you know, he really likes you and everything. And Punky's, you know, not having it. And then he comes over and starts flirting with Punky, which is the most awkward thing ever. First of all, like I said, she's tiny. She's tinier than all of her friends. And he's taller than all of her friends. So he looks like this sixth grader who's hitting on this second grader. It's very weird. None of this bears any resemblance to behavior that I have ever seen or remember from kids this age. No, like not Again, at all. this is this like is, it's taking a script a from school. Beverly Hills 90210 yes. and handing it to these eight-year-olds and yes. being like, read this. Yes. So they go through this thing and Punky's saying, I'm not interested in being your Valentine or giving you a Valentine or making Google eyes at you or any of those things. And then he sneaks in a kiss and he kissed her on the cheek, right? He sneaks in a kiss and she decks him. And then the next scene, they're in the principal's office and they've both gotten in trouble and Henry comes to pick Punky up and the teacher is also there. And then 
Ricky Schroeder comes out of the principal's office having gotten his punishment, and he says, Punky, you know, the principal said I had to apologize. And she says, and this was, this was the part I was like, all right, way to go, 1985 television, teaching all of us about consent. She says, you're my friend, but you're not my boyfriend. I don't want a boyfriend. And if, you know, and if you want something about like, if you want that or whatever, you have to ask before you kiss me. You can't just kiss me. And I was like, yeah, punky. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Henry shows up, her, her foster dad, and his wording cracked me up. He goes, is it true that you blackened a boy's eye? <laughs> right. That, that's his reaction. But yeah, you're applauding the focus on consent and everything. To me, there was something a little off about the way, you know, he goes, ah, well, well, what, what she says is he kissed me with his lips. Yeah. Right. And yeah, so when she's explaining it to Henry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Henry says, well, that was very wrong. He shouldn't have done that, but you shouldn't have punched him and, and you still need to be punished. And what he's saying is totally fine. Like, you know, he's saying two wrongs don't make a right, but this, there's something about the way that it's played that is just a little flipped from the way it would be now, oh, I yeah. think. Whereas now it would be like, sure, sure, she shouldn't punch him. We'll have to deal with that. But we really need to talk about the fact that this boy kissed her. Like right. That's what would really be the emphasis. And back then... It seems like there's it's it's the opposite. No, it's like yeah, yeah, of course he. They can't handled kiss you. it. They handled it in a more flat. Like we're not we're not bringing this to the oh my goodness kind of level. Whereas I you know I can completely agree with you that if this happened in a school nowadays with kids this young, that that boy would not be coming to school the next day. And unfortunately, I don't know that that's the right message either, right? The way that they handled this, where when Henry says, you know, you still have to be punished, the teacher said, no, Punky says, oh, I have to bang erasers after school for the next week. And he says, well, I think that's enough of a punishment then. So he's not going to punish her anymore at home. There is no like, you're in huge trouble for punching this boy. It was, you did what you needed to do or you felt like you needed to do in the moment to defend yourself. You shouldn't do that. You need to bang erasers, but that's enough of a punishment, right? And then the boy comes back out and this is the part that was like, come on, this is why it's 1980s television, right? So Ricky Schroeder comes back out. They have this great conversation. Punky's like, I'm your friend, not your, you know, I don't want you to be my boyfriend, blah, 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 blah. And then the little fucker leans in to kiss her again and she goes to slug him again and they pull the two of them apart. Yeah. He goes, so Punky, you want to kiss and make up? And I wrote, this kid is cruising for a bruising. Yes. <laughs> You know, first time, that's on her. But after that, come on, you you can't, you know, you mess with the bull. Like, what what are you going to, what are you going to do? Yeah, exactly. So somebody needs to have a talk with his dad about teaching him that when girls say no, they mean no, not try again. Right. But we sort of leave that aspect of it. What we're focusing on now is the fact that after all of this melee, Punky is still obsessed with the idea that if she doesn't plan for the high school prom, as her friend puts it, right, because they're all that's the end goal of all of this, right? That's their nest egg that they're planning for is the high school prom. If the high school prom is 10 years away, you have to plan for it now. Yeah. So her friend Margot puts it in Punky's head that if she doesn't have a boyfriend now, she's going to be alone forever. She's not going to have a date to the high school prom. She's going to end up living with Henry, her foster dad, as just a couple of spinsters, basically. Right. And actually during, so they're, they're back at Punky's house and they are having a play date and they're making their Valentines. And the girls, Sherry and Margot, are making Valentines for their boyfriends and, Punky is making a valentine for Henry because what she keeps saying to the girls every time they say you need a boyfriend is I've got Henry. He's the person that I love and I've got Brandon, my dog. That's all the family, all the love I need. I'm happy. I don't need any more. You know, boys are gross. I, she says at the end of the episode, I run faster, spit farther, like all these things. She's like, what do I need a boy for? And, and she really kind of pushes that narrative 
throughout the entire play date with her friends. And it doesn't seem like it's super affected her until she goes to bed that night. And she's having a hard time going to sleep because she's thinking about this idea that her friends keep saying she's going to be old and alone, but she thinks she'll be fine if she has Henry. And she can't she can't marry the two together. Right. And so the dream is going to be her projection of what if that's true? What if I end up old and all alone and I'm still here living with Henry? And so we get... And she doesn't think of it as all alone. She, this is what she wants. She is happy. She's yeah. old and she's with Henry and he's even older. And they have Brandon, who's super old as well. And they're living their lives. At, Henry's 140. <laughs> well, yeah, this begins with a shot of the dog, Brandon, with glasses and like an old lady wig on. Or and like an extra like a, beard. He looks kind of like a lion because yeah. he's a golden retriever. Yeah. So you put a put a, a wig kind of beard shape wig on him he looks like a lion yeah but it's a pretty funny sight gag and it lets you know immediately all right like that that's what we're dealing with here this is going to be a skit right this is the same exact thing they did in saved by the bell i think they do this on the fresh prince it's one of your go-to fantasy things right let's make them old wouldn't it be funny if they're old. And we but, get to do all the physical comedy yes. with everybody who and is this a child case, yeah, acting old. They really go for it. Could This isn't just like, you know, 19-year-old Will Smith putting on a, you know, funny wig and a cane or something. These are all three of the little kid characters in like really extensive prosthetics and wigs and old age makeup yeah Yeah. they really transform them to the point i said they look like characters out of like labyrinth or the dark crystal or something (laughs) like they're really extreme yeah the makeup on punky is wild i mean she really like they they did a great job giving her lots of wrinkles and like the underneath her eyes you know kind of the the way that you age she looks like a tiny old person yeah what she looks like and sounds like is if you've ever seen Poltergeist, the little clairvoyant lady that comes and she's got the high voice and everything and her whole presence is kind of uncanny. That's what little Punky looks like because you're hearing and sort of seeing, you know, an eight-year-old kid, but it's like she's all done up as an old lady. And it she's is trying to do this voice like this, which kind of goes in and out because she's a kid. So. Yeah, but it kind of goes full circle because her voice is sort of croaky like that anyway. She That's has true. that kind yeah. of voice. So, yeah, it's very funny. And we just get them, you know, it's really just... Just 10, 12 minutes of them milling around the apartment. You know, the friends come in one by one. But like you said, it's sort of a fantasy to her, except for the fact that eventually she's going to lose Henry. He's going to get wooed away by uh, by who? The teacher. Punky's teacher has a crush on Henry, which we get a little glimpse of in the principal's office scene. The teacher is kind of trying to, you know, oh, ever since my husband died, I've just been all alone. But I do love Valentine's Day, don't you, Henry? You know, trying to put the moves on him just a little bit. And he wasn't even paying any attention. So, so yeah, it was interesting that that was sort of brought back in this dream. Because in her dream, the way she loses Henry is that he decides he's going to marry the teacher and they're both, you know, very, very old and they're going to run away together and get married. And Punky's like, well, at least I have you, Brandon. And then the door opens and there's another golden retriever that's all done up in like old lady stuff that's Brandon's wife and Brandon runs out and she sits back down on the couch and she says, Margot was right. I'm old and alone. I'm old and alone. I'm alone. And then she wakes up. We get the beginning of the very first of our waking up in a fit and repeating the thing from the dream over and over again. Yeah. So it does ultimately prove to be kind of a cautionary tale. Uh, You know, that sort of, you know, it it ends up being a nightmare, sort of what what I want to, you know, avoid what I'm scared of. But then she wakes up, she talks to Henry, and we get all of the sort of messaging and, you know, kind of daddy-daughter explaining that you would expect. You know, we sort of touched on all these different themes now that are related but distinct. You know, we had the consent piece, but you also have the, you know, you're not really alone just because you don't have a spouse type thing. You know, if you've got your friends and your family and your dog, then that's that's all you really need. You know, it's 
Yeah, it's it's the same messaging we'd be getting if this were, you know, a, a sitcom about Tina Fey or something, but it's right. little punky. Right. And and Henry assures her that she can choose to have or not have a boyfriend when the time is right. And that time could be at any point in time. It doesn't have to be just because her friends are and she'll never truly be alone uh, because of all of the wonderful people she has in her life. Yeah, I don't know. I found this little punky is hard to get a handle on to me. You know, we talked about with different strokes with the 2D guest appearance, how she had a whole different acting style from him and how she was very charming, but kind of stagey and had that like, how you doing? I'm a little kid, you know, and right. punky really has that where there's there's a... a truth to her you know like you really get the feelings you get when she's sad or happy like those emotions really come through but at the same time her delivery is so you know hi everybody what are we gonna do today or like oh no brandon i guess we can't go to the fair you know she just has that old-timey little kid acting style that is a little exhausting yeah, there's something to that, though, because I think that Punky Brewster, the character, is seen as being that in her world as well, right? So she is a precocious kid. Punky is this precocious kid who kind of acts this way. And so the over-the-top kind of kid acting style is also a choice that they're making for who she is in this punky Brewster world. And so there, I think there's that. And then there's also that I just grew up with it. So I like it. And I don't even really notice that anymore. Yeah. All right. Moving on to growing pains. As long as we got each other. So we didn't make mention of this in our theme songs episode, but the people who listen to our podcast absolutely have. We've heard from several folks who were like, how could you leave off the Growing Pains theme song? And you're right. It's pretty great. And it's super catchy. And I've been singing it kind of nonstop since we heard it when we watched the episode the other day. It's it's a pretty good one. I will make no apologies for not mentioning it on the top 10 list. I think that there's <laughs> there are better ones. Here's what I want to say about the opening sequence. Do you remember how, I don't know if it was just for the final season or something, but at some point they changed the intro to this and it was that same song, but it was like an instrumental version or some sort of a new agey version. And instead of all the clips, it became a much more austere opening sequence where they were like panning past like family photos on a mantle or oh, something. Oh, I don't really remember that. No. Theme sequence aside, this was one that I definitely watched as a kid. It wasn't... You know, it wasn't one of my favorites, but I do consider it one of your sort of quintessential, you know, late 80s, early 90s family sitcoms. What I'm kind of marveling at now, you know, we talk about how for all of the history of sitcoms, definitely in the 80s and 90s, you had this sort of formula of a lot of them are about families. There's usually some sort of a hook. Sometimes it's something simple and grounded, like they have different political beliefs or the family is, you know, put together from two pre-existing families. Sometimes it's more out there, like one of them's an alien or a robot or something. Is Growing Pains the most down the middle, straight up, there is a family, there is a man who married a woman, and they live in a house and have some kids? End of concept, right? There is nothing else to it. There is just, it is just a show about a family, no gimmicks, no hooks, no nothing. Yep. I think they saw the continued success of shows like Family Ties, even as the kids got older and they moved away from that sort of parent hippie dynamic with Alex and his, you know, Reagan era youth kind of thing. 
And they said, yeah, we can, we can do this. We can have, they're in, I mean, I guess they're in New Jersey or something, New York, New Jersey area, but not in the city. And they are just a normal family, three kids, two parents, dad's a doctor. I don't remember what mom does. Three kids at this time, we get the revolving door situation after a while when the, you know, original kids get older. Kirk Cameron at this time, you know, after the show was on for a few years, he started kind of having a moment and he was in some movies. I remember my dad never liked him. And when I would ask him why, he would kind of say, you know, it's not like my dad was some kind of tough guy or something, but he would sort of say some version of like, he's he's a little bit of a wimp, you know, he's he's a little bit of a weenie. And... I didn't totally understand that, but now watching this, as soon as Kirk Cameron opens his mouth, I get it. That guy just never got out of talking like this, and his voice is all up and down. Oh, come on, Dad. I don't want to study for the test. I don't want to do my homework. Like, he's just annoying. And I know that sounds like such an old-timey, like, boomery thing to say. I, I just find him irritating. <laughs> yeah, I gosh, I'm I can't remember. Look, there's no denying the fact that Kirk Cameron is attractive. And so I think that's the tiger beat of it, right? Is he's cute. And he was on a famous TV show and he was the older brother. Well, and, and just when when you say the family ties thing, I think that makes a lot of sense. If this is chasing the coattails of family ties and you had okay, Michael J. Fox had this youth about him that as he kept growing up, he still kind of had this baby face and his voice and everything. You always kind of feel like you're talking to a kid. But for some reason, it works for him. With Kirk Cameron, for me anyway, it just doesn't. And that's not saying anything about his later in life foibles, you know, turning into now... He makes movies that are all like for the straight to the Christian mega church distribution market. Right, exactly. Uh, you know, I was not, he, Kirk Cameron was not on my bedroom wall. Like he was not the kind of kid or, you know, boy that I was interested in when I was a kid. But I know that lots of people were into him. So yeah, okay. there's some, there's something for everybody. Not every guy can be Al Borland, Jay. Well, no, Dev, Al Borland, he ain't. My God, if there's, <laughs> if there, I mean, like, not every guy can be your type. <laughs> no, if there was ever an opposite of Al Borland, it is. If you look up Al Borland in the thesaurus, it says antonym Kirk Cameron. <laughs> Luckily. We don't get much Kirk Cameron in this episode. This is going to be a Ben episode, right? So we're focused on the younger boy, the youngest of the three kids. He needs to have his tonsils taken out. He's stressed out. He's anxious. It's a little bit of a contrived setup, I think, how we get this whole thing. But basically, while he's there on the little gurney and they're telling him, you know, just relax. I know you don't want to have surgery, but you have to. And his dad says something like, be a Seaver, you know, Seavers are tough, you know, Seavers are resilient, be a Seaver, make us proud. And he's like, well, then I don't want to be a Seaver. If Seavers get surgery, then I don't want to be a Seaver. You know, this is home alone if it was a dream. (laughs) Yes, exactly. I just I'd rather not have a family at all. So, you know, he says that and then they cart him off to surgery. You know, when we get that conversation with the doctor trying to sort of have a little rapport with him as he's, you know, passing out from the surgery, we get this inside joke where he's like, tell me about your favorite TV shows, Ben. And so he says, oh, well, you know, I like all kinds of shows like Who's the Boss and Moonlighting and that show that comes on in between them. The little kid on that show is really funny. So guess what show that was, yeah, everybody. I'm just going to take a wild guess and say that Moonlighting and Who's the Boss were the shows before and after Growing Pains at this time. You would be correct. And Ben was referring to the little boy being pretty good. And that was himself. Yeah, obviously. So obviously. it's he also mentions Gilligan's Island, which we're going to get a little callback to as he slips into the dream. Yeah, I would say we're going to get a big callback to it because yeah, he he passes out from the surgery. It's one of these things where, you know, I guess if you're really not a you know, if you're if you're really not looking for it, it's trying to pass it off like it's not a dream, like he's just getting up and escaping from his surgery. He meets 
this mysterious cab driver outside, and we get another sort of mini trope here. A lot of times, sitcoms will use the dream sequence as an excuse for the celebrity cameo, right? Blossom loved to do that. I think for a while, that was part of the gimmick of Blossom, is every episode, they would have a fun celebrity cameo in some sort of daydream or something that Blossom would have. So in this case, it's the skipper from Gilligan's Island. Yeah, skipper from Gilligan's Island is the taxi driver. So Ben uh, wakes up. In his mind, he thinks he's waking up before they've begun the surgery because he looks over and they're washing their hands and he jumps down off the gurney, runs out of the operating room. We get a couple of gags with the gown being open in the back and people laughing at him. And then he runs out the front door or runs toward the front door and he bumps into the skipper from Gilligan's Island who says, you know, where do you want me to take you? You know, this... This word on my cap isn't here for nothing, you know, so he's got the cap that looks exactly like the Gilligan's cap, the skipper's cap from Gilligan's Island, but instead of the anchor, it has the word taxi written on it. So they get in the car and the taxi driver knows his address and says, you know, 15 whatever drive. I would be very scared at this point if I was Ben and this weird, jolly cab driver that's just laughing at everything you say and saying weird, cryptic things like, oh, you know, don't worry about where we're going or oh, can't get there from here. Like all kinds of weird, you know, enigmatic sayings. And then when he's like, oh, don't worry, I know where you live, 15 Rob in head lane that's the address like at that point i would be like let me see if i can roll out of the car and you know land on the (laughs) pavement without hurting myself get safe and he says to him he's like wait how did you know my address and he said because you just told me and he's like no but you said it before and he goes what are you talking about and then they just let it go yeah so he gets home and we get what i would say is another sort of You know, in in fiction in general, a sort of trope of dreams and fantasies and stuff, the Christmas Carol slash It's a Wonderful Life sort of what if I didn't exist? What if my family didn't know me type of thing? In this case, it's there's a Ben Seaver there. There's like an alternate bizarro Ben Seaver, who I think is Bobby Budnick from Salute Your Shorts. Did you confirm that? Baby Bobby Budnick. He had been on different strokes and then he was in this and then later on in Salute Your Shorts, he became more of like a bully, right? Wasn't Bobby Budnick kind he's of a bully? He's a little bully. He's more of like your streetwise. Like he's a little bit of a bad boy, oh, you right. know? Okay. Well, so in this, he's a puny little kid. He is, you know, head and shoulders shorter than Ben. He's this little redheaded kid with the page boy haircut. Yeah. He looks and like Dorothy just, Hamill. Don't think we're not noticing the coding that like the redhead kid is supposed to be a little creepy. You know, we're supposed to be turned against this kid from That's right. And as redheads, we are offended. Yeah, it's definitely supposed to, you know, it's supposed to get under your skin a little bit. Like, what is this little sort of hellspawn kid doing here instead of the Ben we know and love? But so, yeah, it's a lot of like the new Ben has this weird sort of like, I'm peachy keen and everything's swell. And G. Willikers, dad, like this, this weird leave it to beaver energy that sort of pervades the whole family. And I don't know, I guess we're supposed to understand like, well, the real Ben is a little mopey and jaded. And so well, so at the uh, we get at the beginning of the episode, we get the scene of Ben's last dinner, you know, last supper or whatever, before he has the surgery. And we get the shout outs to him being kind of a glutton, like he always wants to eat sweets, he overeats, he just piles on his plate. He wants to play video games, but none of his family's into video games, so right. they he don't wants want to, to play, play with him. The Super Vito Brothers, right? Because right. they can't say Super Mario Brothers. So he's got the Nintendo, the actual Nintendo games, like the old gray Nintendo yeah. sort of rectangle the games. NES. And he's like, "You want to play Super Vito Brothers?" And no. And then his dad says, "Oh, I'll play with you." And he's like, "Yeah, you're bad at it. I don't want to play with you, Dad." And so there's just it's this all these ways where. Ben is kind of feeling left out in the family. And then you get this perfect, in quotes, kid coming in. And the whole family, it reminded me of Other Mother 
from yes, from Coraline. Coraline, definitely. But it's funny to me how because the show is so wholesome in the first place, that, how far they had to go to yeah, make it even like more wholesome. Ben's, it was like creepy wholesome, right? Like Ben's character flaws, quote unquote, are he likes video games and, and junk food. Yeah, and junk food. You know, yeah, ten year old kid likes video games, and so yeah, they have to make this kid like this crazy Mickey Mouse Club parody to sort of distinguish him. And like I said, it pervades the whole family and they've all got this creepy vibe. They have some hilariously primitive special effects, like your sort of local weatherman type special effects to show, you know, Ben walking through the family to just sort of make sure you understand. Again, like a Christmas carol, he's a ghost, essentially. They can't see him. And yeah, there's just kind of a lot of this. The... Alternate Ben can see him and interact with him. Yeah. And so I remember watching this episode as a kid. Mm -hmm. And first of all, was shocked to see Ben Seaver's ID. Yes, his family membership card. His family membership card says he was born in 1976. I was like, whoa, that again, another kid that was a little older than me that I thought was my same age. But so I remember watching this. I remember thinking how weird it was that there was this creepy replacement kid. And then they were going to get they were getting into these arguments about, you know, I'm better. Like, I'm a better Seaver than you. You said you didn't want to be a Seaver anymore. And yeah, well, I'm just going to kick your puny little butt, you know, because you're tinier than me. And then he's the little ones like I would do that if I were you. So it was all this fun gaggy stuff. Yeah, it's meant to be like a little bit of a Twilight Zone thing, Mm -hmm. you know, like a little bit of a creepy, uncanny thing. And yeah, ultimately, of course, it's meant to drive home, you know, there's no place like home. There, you know, I shouldn't have ever doubted my commitment to being a Seaver. I shouldn't have said that. You know, of course, they hilariously show you the clip from earlier that episode as though you're at the end of a four-hour movie. And it's like, <laughs> oh, you might not remember this this part that we subtly introduced at the beginning. So let's play that part again. We'll play that again. And you, just, you said you didn't want to be a Seaver. And so then real Ben says, well, I'll go back to the hospital and, and I'll have the surgery and we'll, it'll be fine. And new Ben you see him sort of freak out. Well, yeah, he's he's back. I don't know if it's supposed to be like he died or something, but he's he's in the hospital room. It's all dark and weird and nightmarish, and he's hearing the doctors talk to each other, uh, and they're not acknowledging him. And for as weird and lame as the special effects were earlier, there's this cool match cut where he's in the the little stretcher or the gurney or whatever going like, no, no, I want to be a Seaver. I want to be a Seaver. And as they push him through the door, it cuts to real life. And, you know, they're, they're pushing him through the door out of the operating room, back into the hallway. And it's reality again. But again, I think the way that these episodes are shaping up, it's a nice sort of survey course of like the different subtropes of dreams, you know, yeah. because if the one is like, oh, you know, what will it be like when I'm old? And that's a chance to put on a bunch of funny old age makeup. Now we get the, you know, oh, what if I didn't exist? Or what if I was another person or whatever, you know, and all that? Oh, you know, my family can see right through me. And yeah, I, you know, I, I can't think of all the examples offhand, but this is definitely something that they love to do in TV and movies. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to who's the boss? Well, I am. Okay. Problem solved. <laughs> uh, where do we go from here? Um, so this is season six, episode three, In Your Dreams. Who's the boss? We haven't covered this on the the podcast before. So the premise is there's a working single mother. She's an ad executive and who goes on to actually own her own ad agency later on in the series, commutes to the city for work, needs someone to help out and potentially be a role model for her son. Tony Danza, former baseball player, has a daughter and is divorced or the mom died, I don't remember, but he's looking to change his life as well. He becomes the live-in housekeeper and then they sort of become the kind of 
you know, parents to each other's kids. Judith Light's Angela becomes a sort of motherly role model for Alyssa Milano's Samantha, and then Tony Danza becomes the kind of dad character for the uh, the little boy Jonathan. And then we have funny Mona, right? So at season six, we're well into the will they, won't they of Tony and Angela. Who's the boss really tried to keep that at bay in a similar, you know, in a similar fashion to a lot of other shows. Um, and at this point, they have not yet told each other that they have feelings, but it's kind of clear to everybody sure. else. But the whole premise of this show is very much wrapped up in those 80s gender roles, right? This is a Mr. Mom type thing where it's like, sure, at the end of the day, it's going to be the personalities and the presences of these characters that we like. But part of the hook of the show is get this, the wife is this, you know, workaholic, upwardly mobile, professional type, and the dad is the housekeeper, you know, and not only you see the dad, but he's Tony Danza, right? So you know him as this, you know, rough and tumble boxer type guy from his role on Taxi. And right. wasn't he a boxer in real life? Or I is think that... so. When he was young, yeah, before Taxi. I think right. that's how that role kind of came about. Now, the way I always processed this was as a rival to Charles in Charge, right? To me... It was like, you know, it's like the Yankees and the Mets. You can't like both. You know, you're either a Charles person or a Tony Danza person because they were both these, you know, sort of cheesy sitcoms set in mostly beige living rooms about a family with this sort of Italian tough guy as a live-in housekeeper. But the truth is that there is a world of difference between them. And the reason why I don't think I ever really got into who's the boss, aside from it just being, you know, a partisan divide with Charles in charge, is that it's not really focused on the kids, you know? And of course, I'm sure some episodes are. And Alyssa Milano, in terms of teen heartthrob viability, is absolutely a, a worthy competitor to Nicole Eggert. But a lot of this show was about the adult issues and the adult relationships. And Tony Danza is an adult. He's not like, you know, on the verge of manhood like Scott Baio was. He is a full on man. He He's a dad with a teenage daughter. And I have to say, I don't want to be rude to Judith Light, but Angela was just then and now did not hold appeal to me. She was like, if Big Bird was a human woman, she would be Judith Light, you know? Like, I just found her not appealing, like, not not sexy, not funny. Like, it wasn't like I, I didn't like her, but there was just her charisma for me, like, it, it, it didn't make contact, you know? You should interrogate that notion within yourself because I would say that the reason that probably is is that she defies those gender roles. She defies that stereotype and very much is a woman in control, woman in charge. She, you know, there's a great episode of Community where Abed tries to figure out who's the boss and it, it's really funny. I would say over and over and over again, Angela's the boss. Angela is the boss. She sure. is the boss. And I think there were oftentimes, and that was the press around it at the time, very much felt the same way as you, that she could not be this leading lady. Well, that's why they had to have Mona in there as this more feminine, kind of fabulous character. But I, I disagree. She is tall and lanky and asymmetrical. She has a big, long face. You basically are dating her. <laughs> well... You're not that tall, frankly. <laughs> That's uh, true. I'm not that tall. <laughs> uh, I absolutely would not rule out those kind of biases. But that said, the, the way I experience it is not butting up against her challenging those gender roles. It really is just a matter of charisma. The same way I just don't like Dennis Quaid. You know, it's, it's not anything about him. He's not a bad actor. I just don't get excited when he shows up in a movie. And for me, this, this Angela character was, was kind of like that. For that matter, to an extent, 
this whole cast is a little bit like that for me. You know, the boy, also the teenage boy. Again, I, I was ragging on Kirk Cameron for being a little bit of a weenie. I think I have to put this kid in the same category. Well, he's not even really a teenager. He's a little kid still. Uh, you would think that by the sound of his voice, but I think he is a teenager. You are just not a Who's I the Boss fan. I demand... You know, I demand manly men manhood and feminine testosterone. women. <laughs> so this episode, though, another dream episode written by Daniel Palladino, who we know from his wife's fame. And, uh, you know, he is often a producer on her work. But Amy Sherman Palladino did Mrs. Basil, Gilmore Girls, Bunheads, a whole, the whole bunch, a whole slew of shows. Yeah. So it takes a while to get to the dream element of this. The basic story of this episode is that Tony has to house sit for their friend, right? It begins with this sort of chaotic scene. The kids are leaving, everyone's blah, 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 blah. And their friend is like, kind of guilts him into house sitting. I have a cat. You need to take care of my cat. You need to take care of my apartment in Brooklyn. So the right. important and this thing... Is, this is Tony and Sam's former neighbor from their old neighborhood where they used to live. Right. And she is a recurring guest star, Mrs. Roselli or something like that is her name. And she comes in and she's like a thorn in Mona's side. And she's this fun little foil. And so she's going on a cruise and she says, thanks for letting me borrow your luggage. And also, you know, emotionally blackmails Tony into pet sitting her cat. So he's going to spend the weekend or the next week or something in the city back in Brooklyn in his hometown. So we get to see some really nice return to what his life was like moments. Yeah, which basically involves meeting a few of his old friends, right? We meet his his neighbors. It was basically a married couple and their sister. His, his sister. Sister-in-law, uh, something like that. Yeah. He comes home, he meets his friend, and they're they're gonna go bowling, and then Angela shows up. She wanted to surprise Tony. Yeah, she just she felt bad that he sort of got guilt tripped into doing this. And so she was like, well, if he has to go spend this next week in Brooklyn, at least I'll come hang out with him. And again, we're in this season six. So they have not said that they love each other or how much how they feel about each other. But it's really apparent over and over and over again throughout the series Tony Danza, for for his part, was against them ever being together. Like, he, he very much felt that the premise of the show was that friendship and love that didn't have to become something else, even if they really cared about each other and they were so embroiled in each other's lives because they were raising each other's kids. But so she comes to visit him and realizes right away that she's out of place because she is this Connecticut girl and now she's in Brooklyn with these working class folks. The ladies, you know, the way that they're cast, the way that they're sort of characterized seemed odd at first and then it sort of clicks in. Like everything about them is just supposed to be the opposite of Angela. You're saying how she represents this challenge to the sort of status quo, the sort of retrograde gender roles. They're like like, we sure love those gender roles. You know, the one thing that we live for is being pregnant. Like she says straight up, you know, I used to have a job. I used to kind of uh, control my own fate. But now I kind of like it letting Joey take care of all that. You know, she they're they're just advancing this sort of old school mentality. We like being wives. We like being moms. We like staying home. You know, just everything that Angela isn't. Right. And they, again, I think they do a, an okay job with it because they're they're presenting it without judgment, right? They're saying yeah. that like I'm choosing this. I want this. So so yeah, I I could have worked. I could have done that, but I I kind of really like raising the kids and making food and and that's an okay choice too. Well, right? you gotta... they, they're not they're not trying to come down on that as the wrong choice. No, again in the context of when this is coming out in the mid 80s, the only reason we have this show is because those norms are accepted by society. And there is a funny irony in the woman being the, you know, yuppie uh, success story and the man being the housekeeper. So, yeah, it, it would make a lot of sense that at this time, everyone involved would be sympathetic to these women, whereas now... 
you know, if, if you had characters like this, they would be conspicuously old school. You right. Know, they, it would be more of a caricature. But I think they are going for a caricature here. And I think it's on purpose. Yeah. But it's like you said, it's like a warm hearted caricature. Yes. And they do it in a nice way. And when it gets flipped and we go into Angela's dream and she has become this caricature and she and Tony are married and she has, you know, she gave up her work long ago and they've got a ton of kids and she's hugely pregnant and he's asking for breakfast and they're living in the apartment and you know it's all Brooklyn life the she's imagining they have a conversation on the balcony about it and and he in her dream is like why would you want to work why would you want to leave this and she's kind of struggling to say that you know she is happy but she would like to do other things as well and that's okay and dream tony can't handle it he's like well if you know you want to leave me and you want to go do other things i guess what am i gonna do i'm gonna have to cook and take care of the kids and clean <laughs> can you imagine me a housekeeper Blah. and he's the one that really they they're making fun of this man thing uh, the, like the fragile man of not being able to handle the changing gender roles and they really poke at that through tony dream tony's speech but then angela wakes up and wants to have that same conversation with real tony and that i think is an interesting conversation yeah so we sort of brushed by what the whole dream was yeah she dreams this alternate life that that she had where she and Tony are a married couple and where basically they are living the lives that these neighbors have. And, you know, it's similar to Punky Brewster's old age thing in the sense that it's kind of like hey, you wake up in this other world and this other life. And, you know, we get to see you kind of mill around in that for a few minutes and we have a few gags. The interesting thing about it is that ultimately it's, you know, kind of similar to the other ones. It's it's like it starts out as a dream, like, oh, this might be what I want. And then it sort of mutates into like, no, what I really want is my normal life. Right. Or some variation on that, right? Because you can tell from the moment Angela arrives at the apartment that she is there because she wants to have some alone time with Tony and maybe have a deeper conversation about how they feel about each other or just spend some time with him where the kids aren't around and Mona isn't around. And you see her disappointment when she realizes that he's having a blast with his old friends and she immediately starts to feel out of place. And the women are not judgmental of her at all. And she's not judgmental of them. But you can just see this culture clash that... And so she goes to sleep with this worry of, is this what Tony wants? And could I be that? And so that's what we're seeing in the dream is this projection of, you know, I think I might want to be with him. I think I might want to be with Tony. Is this what he wants? Could I be that? What would it be like if I was that? And that's the dream. And even in the dream, she realizes that she can't really exactly. be that. And so she wakes up worried, wanting to have conversation that same like I said that same conversation with real Tony about what it would be like to maybe be together yeah she uh in a sense the dream is almost like running the simulation of like right. that other world that other path and coming to the realization that no she still veers towards having a career and all that like you said she has this conversation with Tony out on the balcony and then yeah when she wakes up She's still, I don't know, she's just like making these jokes for us, the audience, I guess, because mm -hmm. she's going like, can we talk on our usual spot? And, and he's, he's looking like, at her like, what are you yeah, talking about? Usual you spot, you've never been here before. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they go, out on the, they go out on the balcony again in real life. And yeah, I, I don't know what she, she just kind of says like, oh, do you ever think about, you know, if, if we had a different life, if, if we were together? Well, she, she says, do you, you know, are you sad that you didn't do this, that you didn't have, you know, the wife and the, and everything. And he's like, no, I love my life. I mean, you know, my life's great. I get to live with you guys. This is the great, like, what a great role model you are for Sam. This is so wonderful. And she, you know, and she said, well, would you prefer it if you're, you know, if the person you were with 
was at home and doing the cooking and cleaning and whatever. And he's like, why are you asking about these weird stereotypes? Yeah. Like, that's not who we are. The reason I live where I live is because I think it's ridiculous that these are the stereotypes. I love being home with the kids and cleaning up and making dinner. I'm the best cook. It's, you know, you'd never get my, you know, veal cutlets if it wasn't for me. You yeah. Know? And she gazes lovingly at his like casual progressivism, you know, exactly. like they show her just looking at him like, oh, you're nothing like like dream tony you think that women can have jobs that's right you're the perfect man oh yeah so again it's another sort of you know dream gives you an opportunity to explore alternate scenario what was interesting though is we don't get a lot of the kids in this episode which is a bummer because i really liked Alyssa milano in this she was she was somebody that was definitely you know on my wall because she was so cool like i always thought Alyssa milano was so cool she had the coolest hair the coolest clothes i always wanted to be just like her her and punky brewster i was super into both of them thought they were like the coolest yeah the kid their function in the dream the boy is a greaser, right? Like she's sort of dressed up just kind of like a, you know, like a punker. like a Yeah, sort of... I mean, they're just doing the thing of like, this is what kids look like who grew up in the rough city, you know? And yeah. they're kind of, they're sort of, you know, badass, but not really because they're still kids. And he's talking about riding his bicycle to school. And she's like, and Sam is like, isn't he so cool? He's the baddest boy, you know? But that's like her brother. So yeah. it's just weird. The other thing I, I had about this was just like, I thought that they could have had more fun with the change of her. You know, we talked about yeah. the old age makeup, the, uh, you know, all, all the different, the ways that they can screw around with these dream sequence things. Angela's pregnant in the dream and that's about it, you know, and I feel right. like if you're going to have a dream with an alternate reality, I don't, I don't know, do something, give her different clothes, get different hair. Different yeah, she does do a little bit of the ac of a, you know, New York accent. She she brings that in. But you're right. They also I think this was at the point in time where this series it was past its prime. You know what yeah. I mean? They'd moved it. It used to run opposite the Cosby show. It was a big ratings winner. And then they moved it to Saturday night to try to create like a TGIF, but on Saturday night. And it was with growing pains and perfect strangers. And so they had this Saturday night, like four show block. And there was a cartoon or something that went with it too. There was a, like, the four shows they wanted to make like a TGIF Saturday night and it and it just didn't really work. And all the ratings for all of those shows just tanked on Saturday night because by that time, like we, you and I have said multiple times, all of us who watched them as kids were sort of aging out of watching things. And on yeah. Saturday nights, we were out with friends or we were doing sleepovers or we were doing other things. So they're just they lost their viewership on when they got moved to Saturday night and both Growing Pains and Who's the Boss were canceled the same season. Well, Saturday night is just a bad idea. I think that's just like a Crystal Pepsi type thing. Like, yeah, but that was that was a big time. Uh, Golden Girls was on Saturday night. Like for a while, it was oh yeah, everybody's home, families are home. We want to give them TV to watch, and then going to Saturday night became the death knell because that just wasn't the way of things anymore. People weren't watching TV on Saturday; they were doing other things. All right, moving on to Frasier. Frasier season four, episode three, The Impossible Dream. Yeah, Frasier is a big one. We have discussed the man on Cheers. He uh, ran the seminar for people who were afraid to fly. But now we're getting solo Frasier. Frasier, to me, it's one of those ones that anytime it was on and I was home, I would watch it. Or if it was on in reruns, I would watch the rerun. It's a show that I love, but I have never watched it all the way through. And I couldn't tell you like the various storyline arcs and, and stuff like that. But it never fails. Anytime I watch an episode, it's good for a great laugh. The acting is amazing. I mean, just like what a cast, right? You've got John Mahoney, who is an amazing actor. David Hyde Pierce, another amazing actor. Kelsey Grammer, I think of all the three of them is the weakest <laughs> in terms of in terms of his like acting prowess. But that could just be because he's played the same guy for his whole life. Like he can't even use his real voice anymore 
because the Frasier voice has taken over his whole life. Yeah. Uh, and people, you know, people have their opinions about him off camera and on. I feel like he's become a little bit of a controversial figure. But uh, yeah, you know, we should say this is a spinoff, obviously. And this is one of the great spinoff success stories, yeah. you know. And so when we're watching these YouTube videos about, you know, the 12 failed sitcom spinoffs and why didn't they work? And it seems like, you know, they keep trying these things. It never works. You wonder why do they keep doing it? It's because, like, once in a while when they hit the jackpot like this, it's amazing. And I think the reason why Frasier is so successful is because they honed in and chose the one thing that they were going to take from Cheers, and the rest of the DNA of the show is completely different and new. It's all new people. It's a whole new vibe. It's a different kind of show, you know, still a multi-cam sitcom, but it's not an ensemble the way Cheers was. It's not trying to beat Cheers at its own game. It's doing its own different thing. Sure. And it is an ensemble in a different way. It's not everybody in the workplace, right? It's you've got a family and then you've got like live in help and then you've got a coworker. Yeah. And so that is sort of, it's sort of the like way that a single person moving through the world kind of has the mix of family, you know, your friends and family that sometimes it's colleagues and, and mm -hmm. sometimes it's people in your social circle and sometimes it's people who are related to you. But so I think the thing that Frasier kind of always got right is that they were able to balance the Frasier's whole thing of being sort of high class and snooty with his dad, mm -hmm. who was the down to earth, retired cop kind of energy. And then you had Niles, who also had that upper crust kind of snooty thing. Yeah. But then you had Perry Gilpin, who played Roz. So in every aspect of Frazier's life, he had Roz, who was a little bit more kind of down homey, and his dad, who was a little bit, you know, more working class, he had this reality check to his, oh, everything is so, oh, I'm just yeah. Frasier. Lots you know? of foils, lots of contrasts. Right. I will say, I think David Hyde Pierce is the secret weapon of the show. I think that's yes. a big part of why well, it was so successful. John Mahoney, also. I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, they're all great, but for me, I think he's the one that they were like, this Kelsey Grammer guy has this very specific thing that he does can we find somebody who does something that's very similar, but also fundamentally different? And he just has that. His whole look, his whole manner is just, you know, it's in some ways a contrast to Frasier. In some ways, it's the same as him. And I think the two of them, as we'll see in this episode, when you get them trying to sort of attack a problem together, uh, it's, it's very fun. Yes. So... This particular episode, it's kind of an outlier from the other dream episodes we're talking about. This isn't one where it's like, okay, we're going to have some issue that comes up and then the centerpiece of the episode is going to be this weird fantasy sequence. This is going to be one where Frasier is having a recurring dream that we see variations on several times. And it's all about him trying to figure out what it means, and because this is the 1990s, this is going to be all about gay panic, right? <laughs> yes, and. So again, I think for their time, they did a pretty good job at not trying to go full gay panic. You get... Frazier questioning his sexuality, not in a way where he's actually questioning his, his sexuality, but he's saying, should I be questioning my sexuality? So he's not upset that he might be gay. He's upset that there is this dream that is disturbing him and he might need to have a think about his well. sexuality. And then you have his dad who also, you know, he's more old fashioned and you knew he didn't want, you know, Frazier didn't want to tell his dad about the dream because he was worried he was going to be judged. And then when he does tell his dad about the dream, his dad's like, ah, I don't want to hear this kind of stuff, but then kind of immediately gets past it and gives him some pretty good advice, yeah, but you know? And so, but where I think where we see what you're saying is that in the hesitancy to talk about the subject matter of the dream. 
Yeah, so let's back up and explain what's going on here. His dream is every time he wakes up in bed in a hotel or a motel and uh, he's got a tattoo on his arm that says chesty. Right. And somebody's in the shower, right? We hear like from the next room, from the bathroom, we hear the sounds of someone in the shower. And at least the first time we see the dream anyway, he sort of gets this look like, oh, okay, I guess I got lucky. And then this guy comes out of the dream, who I guess is part of the regular cast. He's a recurring character. He is one of the other radio personalities at Frasier's work, and he is a food critic. And he's very flamboyant. Okay, so he is an openly gay man. That's a, part of his whole thing. Who is often, like, who often makes sexual innuendos. Okay. Like him eating the eclair in that scene where we see them in real life and through the studio studio window he's biting on the eclair and being like oh don't you want John some waters this is your yeah. in your face crazy guy okay so that's who he just slept with this guy kind of comes out of the shower and kind of mugs to the camera and maybe says a line or something and fraser wakes up horrified and that's the dream that he's kind of going around asking everybody or sort of fretting about you know what does this mean and we should also say the other sort of piece of the premise here is he's in a slump professionally. The callers on his call-in radio therapy show are boring him. Right. So he's in this slump at work. The callers are not providing any challenge. He has this one caller, Rudy, who is like, they call him Rudy the crier. And he calls and cries. And that's all it is. Like So he's not getting to activate his intellect in any way. And that will come, we'll find, you know, we'll hear more about that later. But so the first person that he goes to to tell his dream about and try to figure out what's going on is Roz. She offers him zero help and then just spreads the gossip around the office. Yeah, he's going to try to obscure the whole truth about his dream in different ways with his different conversation partners. So at first he tries, tell them about the dream, tell them it's about a coworker, just don't tell them who or the gender. So that's what he does with Roz, but you know, sort of by process of elimination, it comes out that he's talking about Gil, that's this guy, and word spreads like wildfire, and like you said, he doesn't get any insight. Right. And then the next scene, we are in the coffee shop, which at this moment, I got up to go get a cup of coffee because Frasier always does this to me. Every single time, Frasier and Niles are sitting in the coffee shop having the scene, because there's always at least one in every episode where they're in the coffee shop, having the scene where they're drinking their coffee. It makes me want to have a cup of coffee. It's the 90s. It's, you know, between friends, Frasier... The rise of Starbucks. Yeah, we we loved our coffee. I have to say, this scene, you know, this is what I'm talking about with the two of them sort of attacking a problem together. And some of the quotes, you know, their their hoity-toity way of talking to each other. <laughs> when Frazier tells Niles, you know, he basically does the asking for a friend thing. Yes. And Niles goes... Oh, Frazier, that gambit hasn't worked since we were in knee socks. You know, that that's his way of saying, you know, since we were little kids. Yeah. <laughs> so the two of them are trying to figure out this dream. And this is where I say we get a little bit of the 90s gay panic yes. stuff. Now, you're trying to draw this distinction between like, well, he's he's not considering his sexuality, but he's considering considering it or whatever. The bottom line to me is... Anytime it's suggested, like, Frasier, this might be, you know, the phrase that Niles uses later is wish fulfillment. But anytime it's suggested, you might have some sort of homosexual component to your psyche. There might be something going on there. He sort of gets up and spins around and gets all flustered. No, 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 no change the subject. Yeah. And again, it's the 90s. It's played for laughs. Right, because we weren't allowed to be on a spectrum of sexuality in the 90s. You were either straight or you were gay. There was none of this, like, I'm on my way to, I'm in between and this. And that being mischaracterized was just not okay. It's right. the same thing as you throw like a girl or something. It's just like it's not okay to call a straight man gay. 
full stop. And and so we get that, you know, we get that uh, We're going to pull that clip out of context and ruin you. <laughs> Jay is going to be canceled forever because he took a big pause before he said that. <laughs> like Parker Lewis style. <laughs> Parker Lewis uh, style. Yeah. And I just felt like, dude, you're a therapist. Like, you're a psychiatrist. It's not okay to have this, like, heebie-jeebie, yeah. oogie-woogie, oh my God, like, we can't talk about gay stuff, you know? Like, this this idea that I could not possibly acknowledge that, that possibility in myself uh, for a therapist was quite alarming to me. Yeah, no, and that is a point well made because... You're absolutely right. And I think when when we see the other side of that, when he's trying to get beyond that is when he's having the same conversation with his dad later on, because he is the more progressive one, right? So like in that situation, Frazier is the more progressive one. And so he's having to be more open and talk about it in such a way that will help bring his dad over to the side of you can talk about being gay. And that is truly when he starts asking, should I be questioning my own sexuality? Whereas earlier on, when he's having the conversation with Niles, he won't hear it. He's like, I'm not questioning. Like This dream has to be about something other than the fact that that I'm questioning my own sexuality. I know I'm straight. I'm fine. That's not what this is about. Let's keep let's keep driving. Let's keep pushing. But the the inability to talk about it and the uncomfort that he displays for comedic effect yes. is absolutely a, a sign of the times. Yeah, definitely. Again, it's just like, but come on, guys, he's gay. He might be gay. Come on. It's funny. It's funny. Like, you absolutely get that vibe. But so the story, again, unlike our other episodes, which sort of focus on one central dream, he has this sort of trial and error approach to figuring out the dream. There's this idea, as Niles puts it, if you if you figure out what the dream means, then it passes from your subconscious to your conscious mind and you stop having the dream. So it's a matter of going, okay, the gay guy in the shower symbolizes you know, my pet rock from third grade. And so now problem solved, you know, so he keeps trying these different interpretations. Uh, I thought it was very funny. They do, he and Niles do this like stream of consciousness thing where they're like, well, you know, I think this is sort of like a Carl Jung thing of like, let's analyze the specific objects, right? No detail is too small. So he goes, okay, well, I had a croissant, croissant, food, butter. I'm on a diet. He goes, I'm on a diet. Do you think that could be helpful? And and Niles goes, yeah, you could stand to lose a few pounds. <laughs> but being, being about food is one of the interpretations that they try. And so we see again and again, him having the dream, like these different variations of like, who's it going to be this time or whatever. And he can't quite get it. Right. So when they think it's about food, he says, oh, that's it. That must be what it is. I'm I'm upset because I'm not, you know, I should let myself give myself a break on my diet. I'm going to have something. And then he orders something there at the coffee shop. And he thinks when he goes to sleep that night, the dream will no longer recur. And he has it again. Yeah. And so on and so forth. And Daphne finds out about this. And I only bring that up because it was another great uh, Fraser and nihilism. When uh, when he realizes that Niles has told her about it, he goes, "Niles, you gossipy fishwife." You know, <laughs> just another great Fraser quote. But yeah, he ends up talking to the dad, who at first won't hear it, and then is kind of like, "All right, fine, we can talk about it if you want to, or whatever." And yeah, he he sort of he's like, "Well, I have no choice but to confront the possibility that I might be gay," you know, and he kind of like stares the abyss dead in the eyes. But then it's like one one way or another he comes to the realization of like, "Oh no, it's Chekhov's professional dissatisfaction, you know." Right, that was from the conversation with his dad. So earlier they have a coded conversation with the dad, with John Mahoney, and because they, Fraser and Niles think that Hester or Hesty, Chesty on his arm comes from their mother's name, Hester, and maybe she had a nickname that was Hesty. And so they're, they have this like coded conversation and 
Frasier again is like, you're right. This is just uh, an Oedipal dream. That's all it is. No big deal. Goes to bed, has the same dream again, only with a, a few changes. And then, you know, we go on about the episode. So when he has the talk with his dad, he has the moment where, like you said, he is like, OK, I, I think I need to really interrogate my sexuality. And his dad's like, Frasier, you can do that. Fine. But, you know, you're straight as, as long as I've known you. You know what I mean? points out like you're you're 40 something years old like you're you already would have known yeah like you you were you know you were a kid that was always exposed to any type of thing that you wanted you you were never held back in any way and Frazier's like you're right I was very sensitive like I I probably would have come to this already if that's what I yeah. was interested Frazier's in. Frazier's having the same thoughts, you know, I think every straight person has had at some point or another where he's going, well, I wasn't good at sports or I wasn't, you know, like everyone has that moment where they're like, oh, oh, gee, I don't know. But yeah, his dad sort of shrugs it off. Right. I also want to add, you know, when his dad first gets all uncomfortable, when he first introduces the subject, he immediately grabs a sponge and starts cleaning the outside of the refrigerator with a sponge, yes. a dry sponge. He's going to keep himself busy so yeah. he doesn't have to have I this just conversation. I thought that was very funny business. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I feel like it's one of those things that like, as Frazier is sort of Talking his way through this, he kind of takes himself back to the professional, you know, sort Lord of uh, slump he's in. Yeah. Right. And and so his dad says, you know, well, if nothing else, you've had your nose in these books all along. Like, it, it probably means nothing if you can't find it in the books. And Fraser goes, Dad, that's it. I've had my nose in these books. This is what it was. The The whole reason for this dream was that I had nothing intellectually stimulating at work. And so my mind has come up with something that will be intellectually stimulating for me. Oh, joy. Oh, rapture. I'm not a gay. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much it. He's relieved to discover to solve his dream, like we said before. And so I guess he does. But then he has the dream again. Right? right. So he has the dream. And this time, Sigmund Freud comes out of his his bathroom. No, he knocks on the front door. There's Because okay. Fraser wakes up. There's no tattoo on his arm. There's no shower running. He's like, all right. Or he wakes up in the dream. Yeah. He's like, all right, great. This is, you know, the dream has changed. It's different. Now I can just go back to sleep. And he lays back down to go back to sleep in the dream. And there's a knock at the door. And it's Freud. Yeah. But he comes in and is like, great, you solved the dream. Congratulations. And at first, Fraser's like, oh, of course, this is the perfect, like, victory dream. Being congratulated by Sigmund Freud. And I then, have so many questions for you, he says. Yeah, and he basically, uh, Freud gets into bed and is like, let's do it. Yeah, uh, he's like, well, I'll, I'm happy to answer all of your questions, but first, and he gets into the, uh, under the covers in the bed, and and Fraser is like, oh, okay. <laughs> Just yeah. like giving in to the fact that he's going to have homoerotic dreams. Yeah, I don't know. This one, I think this was a pretty fun episode, but almost not part of the trope you know i feel right. like they don't use that trope of the dream in the same way but then again fraser being a psychiatrist and that being the premise of the show it sort of makes sense that they would do something different with it right that they would take the dream sequence aspect into this recurring thing that that he was trying to work out in real life rather than have the whole working out of the thing happen in the dream, which is all of our other shows, that's what they do. They have the person in the dream sequence realize the error of their ways and or or have some moment of clarity where, you know, the subconscious becomes the conscious and then they wake up. Frazier wasn't getting that in his dream. He kept waking up early trying to solve the problem. So if he maybe had stayed asleep longer, if, if he didn't wake up at the time he kept waking himself up, you know, or being so aware in his own mind during the dream, then we could have gotten a different episode. But to your point, 
this is what you do with the show when you have the lead actor being the psychiatrist. Yeah, you got to imagine a lot of the stories are going to be about him having to use his psychoanalytical skills on himself. Right. So I don't know, looking back on these, what they all have in common, again, it's kind of like a nice survey course where each one is doing sort of like a different subtrope of what sitcoms tend to do with the dreams it's always a big swing. I feel like that's what they have in common, is that the dream sequence is always a way to do some sort of a big swing story-wise that you couldn't just do in the confines of, like, normal waking life. And to me, the punky, you know, the punky Brewster takes it in terms of having the most fun with it and therefore being the most fun to watch. Seeing Punky Brewster dressed up, you know, like she's like a little like Oracle from the never ending story or something. <laughs> and her little friend, I forgot to mention the boy when they Alan. put on the it's little so funny. The little mustache and hair on him. He looks like the Muppet character who's like the old man that runs the hotel in the great Muppet caper. Oh they, nice. See, I was thinking he looked like um Uncle what's his name who writes uh from Fraggle Rock who writes the letters. Oh, Uncle Traveling Matt, sure. Yeah. They all they look like creatures. It's just so funny. They're covered in so many layers of stuff. Yeah. Uh, that yeah, they look like these little creations. Well and Sherry, she they made her look like like Tyler Perry's mama, like from yes, Big Mama's house because they put much. her in this huge fat suit and she's like bumping off walls and squeezing through doors and stuff. And the dad, the the foster dad Henry, looks like the villain at the end of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade who drinks from the wrong chalice oh, and right, gets, and like, gets like, like super zombified old. before your eyes. He's got the like fright wig and everything. Yeah, that one they just like I said they have have the most fun with it it's as simple as that the growing pains one is also fun like i like that they're doing that sort of twilight zone sort of the devil and daniel webster whatever type <laughs> thing you know but i think growing pains would have been my number one had it not been a ben episode because ben is the weakest character and actor of all of them i mean he is the littlest one so whatever but he he just wasn't captivating for me and this whole show is about him so i was like all right i mean it was funny and it was cute and they did what they needed to do but had this been a Carol dream or had this been a mom dream or something, I feel like it would have been more interesting. To me, it had to do with the story, like I said, just being like, guys, go go back, spend another 10 minutes working this out, like making this be a little bit more cohesive, make a little bit more sense. The idea that because he doesn't want to get his tonsils taken out, he's going to renounce his family name. Like, it's just kind of like you're mixing and matching your anxieties and your issues. And the Who's the Boss, that was fun. But again, if you're going to make an episode where your centerpiece is going to be Angela having this dream where her life is completely different and she had taken this whole different path... And it's a sitcom, for Pete's sake. Like, yeah, j just do a little more with it. You know, sure, you're on the right track with the fake belly. But I just felt like if it's going to be a dream sequence uh, and an alternate life type dream sequence, you just want to sink your teeth into that a little more. Production value wise, you're not wrong. And I saw that as more of a an episode about Tony and Angela and their ongoing way of falling in love or trying to figure out what their relationship is. So I think that if we if we were more involved in the their relationship and what's happening with them, it would have been a big deal to see Angela show up to spend a week sure. in the city with him. And it would have been a big deal for them to sit down and have a conversation, even in dream, about their relationship. And it would have been a big deal to have that last conversation about, like, who are we to each other, but not really, but do we want that? And do you want this? And what do we really want? I think that would have been a kind of a big step in their, you know, tension rising throughout the series. Yeah. And definitely if you're talking about a show don't tell approach to the idea of her appreciating his 
like we said before, his sort of relatively modern, sort of casually progressive attitude, they absolutely hit that home where you have the dream where she is saying, what if I went and had a job and he disapproves of that? And then she wakes up to a real life version of him that completely accepts their, you know, wild and crazy situation where the <laughs> wife has a job or where the woman has a job. But uh, yeah, you're you're right. On the human side, it does a great job of establishing that. If I'm coming to it from the perspective of I want a crazy tropey dream sequence, you That's know, not it what doesn't you're deliver. Get. Yeah. All right, that about does it for the dreams. What are we talking about next week? Next week, get out your PJs and your pillowcases because it's time for a slumber party. We're gonna watch Full House season four, episode four, slumber party. That 70s show, season five, episode 13, Your Time is Gonna Come. Then we'll watch The Big Bang Theory, season four, episode eight, The 21 Second Excitation. And finally, Bob's Burgers, season four, episode nine, Slumber Party. Yep, that's next week. And until then, we will consider this segment of the sitcom study concluded. Thank you for listening to The Sitcom Study. Tell us what you think or share your own TV tropes and topic ideas by sending a self-addressed stamped email to sitcomstudypodcast at gmail.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram. And if you like the show, consider leaving a rating or review on your podcast app. It helps us boost those precious Nielsen ratings. The Sitcom Study is recorded in front of a live studio dog. Studio dog.